Um, I think that probably with anything, uh, with with any band, probably different now than than back in my day, which was fifteen hundred years ago. Um, probably like a friend or something came over. You know, like back in those days, you know, you didn't have the internet or whatever, so you know, your buddy would come over and be like, "Dude, check this out, ride the lightning," you know, and you'd li- you know, you listen to it. Some friend probably hit me to him. You know, I. I, I MTV wasn't really big. I mean, I, I saw, you can see some video, old videos, but a pro- friend probably hit me to him or whatever. Um, and I remember hearing it and then finding like some sort of footage uh, of Neil. And I remember um, the, the big impact that he had. Uh, the reason they kind of stuck with me was that that was the first person. I know there were people prior to him for you know that existed but for me he was the first uh, kind of acrobatic drummer you know with all had all that stuff and all that motion and and kind of all that freedom to play all those notes and I, I imagine it's the similar it, it's not dissimilar to a 14 year old kid now uh, with a friend that comes over and, and shows him a video of you know Carter Beaufort you know playing for Dave Matthews or whatever where they're just like oh you can do that you know, so I thought, oh, you can do that. You can kind of. Nope. Um, you got to keep all this in there, by the way, <laughs> including that, including Rachel Farley <laughs> laughing at me. Say hi, Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Rachel. Rachel's my therapist. <laughs> Rachel. <laughs> Rachel. Rachel's my relationship counselor. She's yelling at me, telling me to get on planes. I have no credentials, by the way. <laughs> uh, um, no, I think so. I think that I saw that and I was like, "Oh, you can do that." And I think that um, I think so. I think it was just a friend kind of hit me to it, and I, I, you know, I gravitated towards the acrobatic nature of what it was going on because prior to that, I'd only seen like you know Bill Ward, you know, in the Paranoid video and shit like that. So you know, I, I don't. I think that's what grabbed me is like, "Oh, well, you can play all those notes and it's fine," you know. Um, I'll be honest with you. I think that there would have to be somebody way more analytical than than I would have to than I am would have to watch me play, and they might be able to find something that I still do that I kind of plagiarized from Neil. But because that's what we all are, we're all plagiarists. Um, but I think that even at a young age, you know, it's funny. Even though I don't play anything like Neil um, now. Uh, I think the thing that I got, even at that young age, and I was probably, I don't know, 14, 15 years old, I think that I probably um, gleaned, you know what, I remember that was the first time that I thought, I remember, you know, back then you looked at the album cover, and you looked at the jacket, and I could see that he, he had written the lyrics, and I remember thinking, that was my first concept, that was my first moment where I conceptualized uh, a musician, especially a drummer, kind of playing the intent of the song rather than just uh, a supporting role or propulsion. Um, that was where I was like, oh, this guy is playing this, th- you know, he's playing the lyrics as, as, you know, he wrote the lyrics and he's playing what his lyrics mean. So I think more than, more than any technical thing or some hot licks or double bass or whatever, most guys are going to have some specific thing, you know, hi hat work or whatever that they that they took away from Neil. Um, I, I didn't. Um, I liked it, and I and I practiced, and I, you know I played along with it a lot when I was in, when the, in those years. But um, I think what I got from it was playing the intent, you know. And from that moment on, and and a couple of other moments in my life kind of strengthened this concept because I'd forgotten at times, and there were periods where I was just kind of playing for myself and kind of with myself. Um, uh, that From that moment on, I think that's my, my whole drumming style is like, you know, don't play a happy feel in a song about divorce, you know? So I, I, I think, and, and, and it doesn't have to be heavy things. If you're singing about goblins, or you know, <laughs> you know, whatever songs about Dungeons and Dragons. Well, 
play your dorky fell because it's Dungeons and Dragons time. <laughs> you know, you gotta, you have to play the, you have to play the topic. You have to, your content has to match intent, or it's no good as far as I'm concerned. So I think, I think that's probably what I got from. from that. Gotcha. Uh, I would tell him to read read his books first because I'm real big on understanding the human. Because uh, that if you if you know a songwriter and you hear their songs, the story's better. You know, if you hear this song that you think is a love song, but you know the songwriter and you realize it's actually about you know a dead family member, suddenly the story has bigger flowers and bigger plant you know it's a bigger plant you know um, and with Neil I think you understand a lot about kind of the oddity of his drumming and the, his approach when you read his books you know and even the way he played pre-tragedy you know versus afterwards and stuff there isn't a big difference in his playing but I think I, I like comprehensively I think it's important to know to know what you're listening to um, there's a beauty to not knowing of course you know um, there were a million kids in 1974 that was pretty sure Ace Frehley was from space, you know, so not knowing, you know, that he was just some druggie, you know, <laughs> made it cooler, you know, um, but I like knowing the people, but I, sonically, I would say, you know what, this whole body of work is kind of a lesson in playing that intent, which I like, uh, for me, so, so I would say anything, but, uh, to not cop out on the, on the question, I would say uh, moving pictures top to bottom and 2112. I'd say listen to that, you know, because there's still some anger in like temples of the syrinx and things like that. There's still some 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 grit in those older things, and and uh, moving pictures top to bottom is just a tour de force. I mean, the drumming, the 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 arrangement, the, even the order of the songs. I mean, it's just badass. So you know, that's one of those things. That if you're gonna dig in and kneel get that one chew it up when you're done with that a few times go get 2112 and listen to him when he was a kid you know that's what i would do <laughs> to select <laughs> what led me to select it i the the, the funny answer is <laughs> chris nix sent me a text that said i'm doing limelight <laughs> um and the longer kind of, you know, the kind of more important answer, I think, is that with this thing in particular, I'm not a big jammer. So when friends are like, hey, come jam, I don't. And I don't for a couple of reasons. A, I can't do what those guys on Broadway do. I don't have the body of work in my head. I don't remember. I barely remember Randy Hauser songs. I just follow him, you know, and that's how I like to play. Um, I like the interaction. I don't even care about the arrangement. If I screw up. I'll just do it again, and people will think I meant to do it, you know. So with the jams and with, like, if somebody says, come down here and sit in with my band, there's somebody else in the room, inevitably, that really wants to. And I'm lucky enough to be friends with the guys that are putting this on. I mean, Dave, you know, David Parks and Tom Hurst are my buddies, and, and you know, beyond being their friend, I guess I'm lucky enough to have enough value as a drummer for them to want me to do it. Um, and happy to do it happy to be on it lucky to be on it so and a part of me is just like like when we did the Picaro thing everybody wants to play Rosanna just to see if they can you know but I knew even then I was like yeah pick it tell me what I'm doing you know, tell me what you would like me to play you know and and you know Tom Hurst and David Parks and Chris Nix everybody involved is going to say you know they're gonna have some if their their friends are doing this so they're gonna be like oh man you know what I want to see Kevin play well, tell me that I'll do that one you know because we're here for fun and we're here to you know this is this is a, a relaxed thing so I've always just let let those guys choose and you know when we did the Zeppelin thing they wanted to hear me play the ocean I played the ocean if if they want me to do I I think I told Parks don't give me if you give me La Villa Strangiato, I'm going to drive to your house and kick you in the marbles, <laughs> you know. Um, but but there's some other guys that I knew were going to really want to do something. They're going to be like, I want to do Tom Sawyer. I want to do the Camera Eye. I want, and I cannot wait to hear McDonald do that. <laughs> I'm so excited to hear Pat McDonald play. Um, 
but somebody's somebody's going to really want something, you know. So whatever they want me to do, I'll just do that, you know. Like the Picaro thing, you want to do Rosanna, but I don't want to fight my friends to do it. I'm there to see my friends, and when they were like, when I said who's doing Rosanna, and they were like. Nick Buda, and I was like, of course he is. Of course he's doing Rosanna. He's going to do it way better than I'm going to do Rosanna. That sounds like a great idea. Let him do Rosanna. So I, I got a, literally, I got a text. It said, limelight. So I figured, okay, I guess I'm doing limelight, and I guess it's Rush. <laughs> I guess it's a Neil Peart show. Peart? Peart? Whatever his name is. Neil whatever. I call it Pert because I'm a country boy. You know, but yeah, I, that was, I was told. That's how I chose. I was told that I was doing limelight. Now I've got to learn it. You're uh, <laughs> um, You know, what's funny about Nashville is, and I've seen kind of all the music communities around the world, um, Nashville is so different uh, in a lot of ways. And one of the big ones is that is that in everywhere else there are little pockets, and there are pockets here too. But I mean, there are, you know, if you if you call Jason Sutter right now and said, name off, rattle off the guys you have coffee with, you hang off with, hang out with regularly, in L.A. When you're not on the road with Manson or Smash Mouth or whatever, and he'll have, he'll, you know, I don't, he and I aren't super tight, but you know, he probably has like five or six dudes that he rolls with, you know, um, and then. 50 others that are ancillary characters, you know, but there's kind of no ancillary characters in Nashville. Everybody knows everybody and everybody's kind of tight with everybody. And at any given time, you'll see two dudes run into each other and there's a big hug and there's a what's up and there's a trading of schedules. And then, you know, so this is one of those things. I, I like it because a, it's for charity. And if one of our buddies like miles smashes himself and he needs some, needs some help. It's great. St. Jude's great. If it's, you know, it's a charity, anything charity is good and I'm hip to do it. But beyond that, it's like one of those things where we never see each other because everybody leaves town Wednesday and everybody comes home Sunday. And you know, as much as I want to see most of these guys, you know, I'll bump into McHugh or Keo or whoever somewhere around town and it's always great. But like, I'm not going to call Kent Slusher and say, hey man, let's hang out on Mondays. The last thing I want to do is see Kent. He's got a little cute, adorable little baby girl. Like, I want 20 minutes of his time? No, go spend it with her. Because if you call me and I have a chance to hang out with my daughter, I ain't meeting you, you know? So we don't hang out, you know? So this is an opportunity to see each other, you know? I don't see Marcus Finney and I don't see Tucker Will. I don't see all these guys all the time, you know? So this is a chance to like, you know, catch up. And the funny thing is like, it's so, the camaraderie is so interesting and so vibrant and it's such a fun event. I mean, half of us are there, just, it's kind of like a NASCAR thing. Half of us are there because we want to see our buddy just tank. Just tank it. Oh, my God. It's somebody, I don't know who, but one of my very good friends, I'm sure, cannot wait to see me crap my pants in the middle of limelight. I, you, know, you, you know, you're like, oh, here it comes. Here comes that big fill. He's going to blow it. And, and, we, and all of us have made little mistakes. And the funny thing is, you know, like, how many times have we seen, like, somebody blow something and there's, like, this huge burst of laughter? Because everybody knows. Everybody's like, God, Christ. And, He's hammering through this song. He's never even rehearsed it. Like, awesome. You know, and it's fun to see each other. And the whole room is hugging all night and catching up. And I hope this, I'm glad it's kind of expanding and getting bigger. And I hope that it gets to a point where people realize that if you can be in Nashville on a day when this 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 event is happening every few months, you should. You should, just to see it. Because it's different than L.A. and it's different than New York. And it's, it, it's, it's different than London, you know. It really is like the dudes in that room are genuinely very, very happy just to see each other, you know, and and watch each other screw up. <laughs> I promise I will give I promise I will give at least three of my friends a, a hearty laugh trying to pull that damn song off. Promise. <laughs>